Worry, I think, gets a lot of bad press because we don't use it very well. And so when I call it worrying well, it's really about what is worry, how do we do it, what's the purpose of it, is it possible that worry has a positive function, which it does. Uh, worry basically is an adaptive function. It's, some, it's something that allows us to go over and over something in our minds in an attempt to solve a problem or resolve a situation. So I think that that's the adaptive, you know, we humans have been born with faculties in our brain that as far as we know don't belong to any other creature on earth. And it has allowed us to, you know, to come from being a pretty vulnerable prey animal on the African savanna to becoming the dominant creature on earth. It's, you know, we, we don't have many tools for survival. If you look at a human as an animal, um, you know, we're pretty vulnerable. You know, we don't run very fast. We don't have big teeth. We don't have big claws. Um, you know, we can swim a little bit, but not very well. We can't fly very well. So out there, you know, without a lot of technology and on the African savanna, we are meat, basically. And, um, and we've got systems built into our system that we inherited in, from the development of other prey animals that lead to things like fight and flight response, which are adaptive in some situations and maladaptive in another. But one of the things that are, that one of the qualities that we've developed is or one of the mental abilities and functions is, the ima is imagination. It's, I could really make a strong case that imagination is, is one of the key things and maybe the key mental faculty that separates the human from, the not, from all other forms of life. It, imagination lets us remember things from the past. It lets us project things into the future and think about how things would be in the future if you did something this way or that way. You know, and everything that exists on earth that wasn't made by God or nature, whatever, pick, take your pick or some combination of the two, everything else that exists, everything that humankind has created started in somebody's imagination. That's where it made its first appearance on earth is somebody's imagination. Oh, we could do that. You know, we could make it round and a roll. We could chip these, you know, they notice that two rocks chipping together makes fire and they figured out a way to do that. So imagination, you could make a case that outside of God or nature that the human imagination is the most powerful force on earth. And the thing is, very few of us have ever really been taught how to use it. Most of our education, especially all the way through to higher education, is on using other mental faculties which also have made us very powerful. The ability to analyze, the ability to calculate, the you know, um, linear, logical, rational, scientific ways of thinking have also contributed to us being very powerful uh, because they allow us to take the things that we imagine and make them real in a certain way. But a lot starts in the imagination. Worry is a function of imagination. If you didn't have an imagination, you wouldn't be worried. That's what lobotomies are about. <laughs> and that's what, a lot of, that's what certain medications are about. So we used to joke at our Academy for Guided Imagery, you know, that if we could find a simple non-toxic way to do an imaginectomy, we could resolve everybody's worry and stress problems. You, know, you, would, you just wouldn't be very worried. You wouldn't do much either. You wouldn't be creative, you know, you wouldn't, but you wouldn't be worried if we could do that. So I think rather than taking the imagination out, what we want to do is learn how to use it better. And so a lot of what I'm going to share with you about worrying well or worrying more effectively has to do with how you use your imagination. So worry and stress have a lot of overlap. Right, and we often use them interchangeably. I'm going to spend a little time to differentiate these things a little bit, but they do overlap quite a bit. And then anxiety also overlaps with worry and stress. They're all a little bit different, and they're very interrelated. Um, they share in a lot of different kinds of ways. The reason this is important is because our consciousness and our ability to become self-conscious is potentially the greatest tool that we have for improving our lives 
And it also, if we don't know how to use it, can be something that can make our life miserable. So I like this Ashley Brilliant quote, you know, due to circumstances beyond my control, I am master of my fate and captain of my soul. So like, you're it. If you want to do something about your anxiety, your stress, the way that you think, the way that you create your life, you know, you, you are the captain whether you, whether you like it or not. Um, so we might as well learn how to use these capacities because there's really no going back. I think sometimes unconsciously we try to go back with other ways of managing anxiety and stress like drinking too much or taking drugs or medications or eating too much, all the millions of ways we have of going unconscious and kind of trying to just put our head in the sand and maybe it'll go away, which it frequently does. So it's, it's not that it's not a good strategy in the short run, but as a total life plan, it's kind of lacking. Okay, it won't take you where you want to go. So how are worry, stress, and anxiety different? So worry is a type of, this is how I think about it, and I can be argued with. I'm not sure that any of this is absolutely true. I'm kind of throwing it out there. I'm writing a book on it, so if I'm wrong, please tell me before the book is written. Um, but it seems to me that worry is a type of thinking, okay? It's a... And our friend here, Ziggy, says, the figments of my imagination are out to get me. That's kind of the most common use of the imagination, is just letting your imagination kind of go to the worst seen scenarios, getting kind of entranced or hypnotized by, by your worries, you know, and uh, letting your imagination scare you. Because I think, in a sense, the most common the most common unconscious use of the imagination is to drive ourselves crazy or worry ourselves sick. So the bar is set pretty low. That's the good news. We can learn to use it more on purpose and do better than that. So worry is a type of thinking. It's a repetitive kind of thinking, a, sometimes a rumination. It's generally troubled. It often has to do with things that are either in the past or in the future. Okay, it's, it's the opposite of be here now. Okay, it's the opposite of present center. That doesn't mean it's bad, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a function, but it's, we're in our brain, we're thinking about something, we're going over and over and over it. And again, I think that's because the adaptive function of worry, I always assume that something is there is an attempt by, by nature or by life to solve a problem or to give us an advantage. So if you think about what could the advantage be of being able to go over a problem over and over and over in my mind? Well, to, I think it's kind of like if you have a big tangled ball of yarn or, or thread, you know, and you're, you're trying to untangle it and you find a place that's loose and you pull it for a while and you get some, some looseness and then it gets stuck again so you turn the ball over and you find another loose place and you free up some more stuff and you turn it over again and you free up some more stuff. And if you keep doing that, turning it over and over, looking at it from different angles, finding the loose places, finding where things are knotted together, <clears throat> excuse me, if you persevere with it, more, you know, more often than not, you're going to get that whole thing untangled. And then go on to the next tangled mess that you find. Okay, But you are likely to get that one untangled. And I think that's the function of worry. It lets us, it makes our it makes our concerns transportable, you know, so you can think about it at any time, and that can be an advantage or a disadvantage. And I think that that depends on whether you're using your brain or, or you're being run by it. So your brain is an incredible organ. Your mind has something to do with it. And um, at least in certain circumstances, your mind can learn to use your brain in better ways. That's what this is about. So it's very easy, though, for this adaptive function of problem solving and turning things over and over to become a habit or to become repetitive and to become ruminative and just kind of become its own thing. And I, and I think there's a couple reasons for that. One is that <clears throat> worry can serve kind of a magical function. There's a magical unconscious function of worry um, 
a couple of them actually. So one is that most things that you worry about never happen. Most things that you worry about never happen. And if you, you know, that's an old rubric that we've all heard. And I found myself wondering, well, is that really true? So I've been teaching this as a six-week class, this Worrying Well class. I've taught it a few times now. And I've asked people over the, at the beginning of the class to list all the things that they find themselves repetitively worrying about. And then sometime later on, we've just checked in with the first class, which was about nine months ago, to see how many of those things have happened. And not very many of them have happened. So I don't know if anybody's ever studied that really before, but you could do it yourself by writing them down and then check in in about six months or a year. Now the interesting thing about that, the way that the brain works is, at some unconscious level of the brain, it, the brain could conclude that the thing didn't happen because you worried about it, right? That's a function of, and there's an old story about a woman who walks around her house. She's an old woman, she's walking around her house every day, mumbling, walking around her house, walking around her house. She walks around her house all day long until she's carved a rut around her house and then goes up to about the middle of her thighs. And finally, one of their neighbors can't take it anymore. And he, he goes over and he says, you know, I hope you don't mind if I ask you why you walk around your house all the day, every day. And she says, well, I'm keeping it safe from tigers. And he says, well, you know, we're in Indiana. There aren't any tigers here. And she says, see? <laughs> okay. So it's possible that we get rewarded for worrying because so many of those things don't happen. And at some magical, unconscious, primitive level of thought, those two things could possibly be connected. The other thing that has been researched is that and sometimes worrying about things distracts us from things that are actually bothering us. So that worrying about little things and do lists and so on and so forth and always fussing and always worrying and always having something to fuss up about and to worry about actually distracts us from something that might be deeper and more emotional and, uh, and actually be harder for us to take. So. And, and we know that that's a function. That's actually been studied. So that worry prevents deeper, richer, more emotion-laden th emotion thinking, which typically comes in images and comes in the quiet times. You know, So if there's a lot of feeling there that's hard to process or hard to feel or that's unprocessed and that, and that we've never dealt with, it's, in a sense, useful to keep the mind very busy. Because if you get quiet, your emotions will come up. And ultimately, we think that that's a good thing. Emotions are natural, they're healthy, they have a wisdom to them that most of us have not also been educated in. But they can be hard to feel, you know. Nobody, very few people have very much trouble feeling joy. Um, Although a lot of times we're blocked from feeling joy because we are unable or unwilling to feel other emotions. When you start feeling one emotion, you know, the others go, hey, the door's open. And they might want to kind of come up and be felt. Uh, so there are functions of worry. And again, some of them unconscious, magical, maybe not in our best interest over time. Others adaptive problem solving, go over the problem. So it, it behooves us to kind of learn what we're doing with the worry. And that gives us choices in terms of what we're doing with the rest, OK? So worry is a thinking function. Whereas anxiety, anxiety is, a, you know, is an uncomfortable feeling. It's usually in the chest or the upper abdomen. Not always, but it's most often up in this area or this area. It's an uncomfortable feeling of fear or apprehension or dread. Dread is a, it's a, it's that feeling, oh my God, something bad is going to happen. I know it. Something bad is going to happen. You don't know, you may, it may be attached to something, or it may be free floating and not attached to, to anything. And anxiety often comes with physical symptoms like rapid heartbeat, uh, pain in the chest, sweating, you know, shortness of breath. 
Um, there's often a feeling with anxiety, if anxiety is very strong, like panic attacks, um, there's often a very characteristic feeling that comes with panic attacks, and the feeling is of is impending doom. People with panic attacks, they feel they're about to die. And it's often, again, since the symptoms are often in the chest or in the abdomen, we see these things in medicine all the time. And you could, you could really make a case for, you know, one of the, maybe the primary function of a primary care doctor is seeing if there's anything else but anxiety going on. Because anxiety can cause so many symptoms in so many systems of the body and make us, and make us afraid. Um, sense that something bad's gonna happen. Anxiety is a function of a part of the brain that is a, the emotional part of the brain. It's called the limbic system or the emotional brain. So worry belongs to the thinking part of the brain. You know, and there's a lot of interaction, but worry belongs in the thinking part of the brain, the cortex. Anxiety typically comes from the limbic or emotional part of the brain, and I'll show you what that looks like. And stress, which is the third leg of our uncomfortable stool here, is actually a physical response to a threat, real or imagined. And, uh, and in modern life, most of the threats are either perceived or imagined, but they're not, you know, we, so somebody's probably told you the story of the saber-toothed tiger and the fight-or-flight response and so on. You know, that this is a response we think was designed by nature, so when you walked out of the cave and you ran into a big predator, like a saber-toothed tiger, your part of your nervous system fires off and you get a big shot of adrenaline and your heart beats faster and you, uh, your blood clots faster and your blood pressure goes up and your muscles get supercharged and you're ready to run or, uh, you know, run the fastest two miles you've ever run in your life or fight the tiger to death, you know, and then it supercharges you. It's that kind of thing we hear about when the mother moves a car to save a, save a baby. The thing is that this response can go off in response to threats that are not predators, that are not, it can go off in response to stock market movements, economic changes, um, thinking about aging, um, thinking about whether you can meet your responsibilities, all kinds of stuff, and all kinds of stuff that is that unless you know where the off button is on your television or your radio or your computer, that you can just literally pump into your, into your brain, you know, 24-7 if you stay up. All the bad news of every bad thing that has happened around the world to anybody, or if it's a slow news day, what could happen? Okay, you know, like the H1N1 flu, because it's, not a terribly, doesn't look like a terribly dangerous flu right now, but it could become really dangerous, you know? And that's what's got everybody scared and everybody freaked out and standing in line, what could happen? So, and yes, there's a balance between, again, being able to predict the future and take measures to prevent things happening that don't need to happen and freaking out for months about something that probably will never happen. It's a yin-yang kind of relationship. So stress, is the important thing here is that stress is a physical response. It's not stuff that happens to you. It's a physical response that your body has to survive a short-term th stress. And if you survive that short-term stress, like, fight, like the saber-toothed tiger, you know, you've either killed it or you've run away from it and run the, you know, as fast as you can, climb the highest tree that you can. You burned up all these stress chemicals, and when the tiger goes away, you kind of limp back to the cave and breathe a big sigh of relief and tell everybody about how you killed the tiger or ran away from the tiger. And, and your body rested and compensated and recharged itself and replaced all the chemicals that it used during that intense 20 to 30 minute fight. You know, or else the tiger has eaten you and you don't have any more stress, you know, but one way or another, it's all over in about 20 or 30 minutes, <laughs> okay? So there's none of this, like, uh, years, you know, of stress that go on if you're a good worrier, where you wake up in the morning and the first thing on your mind is, 
oh my God, what's going to happen with this? And we're going to be able to do this, and we're going to be able to meet that, and so on and so forth. And of course, the really good warriors are not only doing it during the daytime, you're up at night too, because you can't sleep, right? And so it's taking you, and that takes your resilience away, and it becomes a real, you know, negative, vicious cycle. So, to review, worry is a type of repetitive circular thinking. Anxiety is an uncomfortable feeling of fear or dread. Stress is a physical response that prepares you to meet challenges. 